the, the last part of the course um, is about um, using um, more than one phase to um, obtain interesting steel properties. So I want to remind you of the uh, this graph here, and as I was looking at it, I kind of didn't like, but you may want to go back and change this into sigma, and here just strain, and here just stress, and that way it's uh, uh, kind of more consistent, the left-hand side with the right-hand side. Anyway, um, what it what it showed us is that in general, um, and, and it's not only for steel, for many materials, um, uh, metals and alloys, um, w we get this kind of stress strain curve. So we have a starting um, value of the strain hardening, and then an intermediate value, and then a, a saturation value. And, and we know that we can understand this basically um, by thinking about strain hardening as a consequence of dislocation density evolution and that when you reach saturation here you have basically a, a point where the amount of dislocations you generate is balanced by a process called dynamic recovery that means you uh, basically annihilate uh, the uh, dislocations in the microstructure and you get a you cannot accumulate dislocations anymore so the strain hardening is finished and and so indeed if you plot the strain hardening in general uh, it will always go down yes it'll always go down and now wh why are we so interested in this strain hardening well because of this point here. This is this point here where the, um, uh, the uh, strain hardening is equal to the stress, yes, is the point uh, where we have the maximum strength and the maximum uniform elongation. Okay? And so we want to get this point, we want to increase this point, we want to increase it um, beyond um, this value of the strength, yes? And we, and we want to increase it beyond this value of the strain hardening. Okay. So we need to have ways to increase the strain hardening. Okay. And it's very difficult. You, you, can't, you cannot really do this by adding... Um, um, by adding uh, solutes. You cannot do it by adding, by reducing the grain size. Um, if you add precipitates, same thing. In general, what you actually find out is that um, uh, when you reduce the grain size, we've already seen this, you actually have collapse of plasticity. You know, So you get lots of strength, but you don't have plasticity. So that's not that interesting um, for, for many applications. Then, um, and the same holds for uh, precipitates. Hmm? You have lots of precipitates in a solid, you will tend to see a reduction in the uh, formability. Okay, so, um, so uh, there is a need to uh, go into alternative concepts and um, this is what uh, we'll, we're going to be talking about now is how how do we uh, go about doing this and in these microstructurally strengthened steels. Hmm? All right. So so what we do is um, to to achieve this. What, one of the things we can do is. Um, insert a, a hard second phase in the microstructure. So, and so it's, it seems a little bit interesting that you'd be able to 
improve plasticity by adding something hard in the microstructure. So it's because you would think if I put something hard in the microstructure, I can make it, I can, you know, have a composite effect, get it, make it strength, stronger, but not necessarily accumulate more dislocation and get more strain hardening. Um, you can uh, make use of something that's really interesting in steels and that is up to now not that much exploited in many uh, um, situations is the fact that steel goes through phase transformations. Yes, And you can use this to control the microstructure, but you can also use it to control mechanical properties. Yes, And that's uh, uh, so that's also available, yeah? And, um, and there are not that many um, metals and, and, and alloys which have that uh, possibility. So you can have uh, either the matrix or part of the matrix undergoing a stress or a strain-induced transformation. One of the things that steel does uh, and uh, ferrous alloys can also do is undergo deformation twinning. So you can <coughs> use that phenomenon. And you can do it, uh, you can make a bulk alloy that undergoes that phenomenon, yes. Or uh, you can have a dispersed uh, phase that undergoes that, uh, the deformation twinning. So it's very interesting and you have lots of op op possibilities Basically, possibilities are um, endless, limitless. Mm? Um, however, and that's been one of the main reasons why this, um, uh, this is not being exploited as much as it could be exploited, is it, it requires a very uh, a much deeper understanding of what's going on in the microstructure. Mm? So, and of, of the, of the plast what I call the plasticity enhancing mechanism. Because you don't only have to control the, the strengthening yes, effects, but also the uh, transformation effects. Um, and then what we'll see, uh, there is a complex interaction between the phases also that you have to take into account. All right. So having said this, uh, multi-phase materials are, are actually very common. This is a constructional steel I introduced on, on Tuesday. Um, it contains 0.2% of carbon. Uh, the carbon is not present as carbon, it's present as a carbide. And uh, it's actually present in all, it, almost entirely in this black phase here, at this higher magnification. And if you look at it in an SEM, you can see this nice alternating fringe pattern. Uh, and of course, you all know that this is perlite. So uh, that's where the... Uh, the carbon is, it's present as carbide and as lamellar uh, uh, phase. Hmm? And so when, when we add carbons to, to uh, iron carbon uh, uh, alloy, hmm? uh, what, what you'll see is that uh, the, as you increase the amount of carbon, right, you increase, you, here you go from a tenth of a percent of carbon 0.4, 0.5%, 0.8% of carbon, you gradually increase the amount of, uh, of perlite constituent in the microstructure. So, and you can already see what uh, the effect is of adding this uh, phase is um, you, the, the UTS uh, of ferrite is uh, around, uh, well, depending on how much it's alloyed, but, you know, 100, 200 uh, MPa. So as you add this, uh, the, the perlite, and you have something like a perlitic steel or a hyper uh, steel or a ultra-high carbon steel, um, you see that you can achieve strength levels which go, you know, which are just absolutely fabulous. Yeah. Okay. So that's interesting, and you can already see um, that. Uh, and, and you know, you know, we're getting close to, you know, what people agree is about the theoretical strength of steels, right? Which is about G divided by thirteen, G divided by fifteen, depends on how you approach it. But it's you know, it's extremely strong material. Yeah. 
Okay, there's something interesting about this phenomenon and um, ab about this uh, 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 perlite, yeah? and in particular, the fact that we have lamellar perlite. Okay, that's really important. Yeah? So, right, so let's have a look here at um, the, uh, the basic simple uh, idea. If I have perlite, hmm, I have basically two phases, yes? And what does this remind you of? Of a composite, yeah? It's actually a very nice composite material. And so you know that what, what, if we want to understand the behavior of the composite, I need to have a first look at alpha phase, the ferrite, and theta. Theta is another way, theta carbide is another way of saying uh, cementite, yes? And, uh, well, this is the, uh, 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 and this is a typo, of course. Um, the um, stress-strain curve of pure cementite, actually, if you have one, please give it to me. It's uh, impossible to get by. Um, and people have tried to make cementite and then uh, stress it and try to measure what is the yield point, uh, does it have any elongation at room temperature. So we don't really know anyway, so, but we can guess what it might look like if we were able to measure it. It's just very hard and it just breaks before it yields. So but we think it probably looks like something like this with a yield point around three, uh, three gigapascal, if not higher. Yeah. And then we have the ferrite. The ferrite's here. It's a very, uh, very soft material. Yeah. So we know that um, the, w whatever the properties will be of a perlite, it's got to be somewhere in between, yes? In between the two. And um, we also know that we, that from the theory of composites, that um, there will be what's called stress and strain partitioning, yes? And that, um, and I'll say a few things about this in a moment, you will have very high stresses in the, uh, the hard phase, in the, in the cementite, very low stresses in the ferrite, but the ferrite will do the deformation, okay? So this brings um, to uh, uh, the, the, the idea, of course, that if, if you have a material that you know, one phase doesn't deform at all, yeah, and the other one can deform, um, so as soon as you, do, you apply deformation, the very strong phase will, will probably break very, you know, will fracture. Hmm? And that's what you see if you have small cementite particles in the microstructure, yes, and you do a tensile test, small cementite particles, not perlite, right? Small cementite. You will see that these particles break or they delaminate. Anyway, they're the, they're the cause of much trouble in terms of plasticity. However, if you do the same thing with lamellar perlite, no problems. The cementite in the lamellar perlite can deform plastically. So, it, so it's not only the strength of the separate phases that's important, but also the phase morphology in a, hmm? okay? So let's, let's have a look here um, of, so, Typical lamellar perlite, of course, doesn't have, it's, it's a composite, right? Does it, does it doesn't have a stress strain curves of gigapascal. So it has a stress strain curves with a UTS of around 1,000 um, megapascal, okay? Like, like this one here. So, all right, so now if we look at ferrite perlite, so now I have not 100% perlite, but I also have ferrite grains, yes, around it, and here another perlite grain, yes. So if I have a two constituent uh, material consisting of perlite, yes, and ferrite, yeah, I can also consider this to be a composite. Yeah? 
So this would be the stress strain curve of the, the perlite, yes, which has, a, as I just said, a, uh, a UTS of uh, close to 1,000 uh, megapascal, and this is for the ferrite. So again, um, the stress strain curve I will get will depend now on the phase fractions. Hmm? The phase fraction of perlite and the phase fraction of, of ferrite. So if I increase the volume fraction of perlite from 22 to 43 to 65, the stress strain curve of the steel that I get will gradually move to the stress strain curve of perlite. Hmm? And always with the same uh, composite effect that there is stress and strain partitioning, the, the, the hard perlite phase is under more stress, yes? Much larger stresses than the ferrite phase. Uh, the ferrite phase undergoes more strains than the perlite phase, okay? All right. So, and this, in constructional steels, that's the trick that people use to make different grades. They basically add more or less carbon. The carbon, of course, it's not the carbon that makes anything, yes? It's actually not even the cementite, that does the, it's the perlite phase, yes? That, uh, okay, so I add more perlite, I get stronger constructional steel, yes? And, and you can see, I can make very soft constructional steel, and I can make very hard ones, yes? I have a, a very wide range of possibilities here, okay? And if you look at this, you'd say, well, boys, uh, you know, perlite steels, we're already over one um, megapascal of strength. Um, why don't we use perlite steels? It's, you know, it's cheap and um, no problems, right? We're happy in terms of what I've been telling you in this course. The trouble is, first of all, the amounts of strains you can get, yes, the the cementite does deform, but it doesn't deform that much. 10%, you know, as, you know, 10, 15%, that's about the limit. So the cementite will, even the lamellas will eventually break. Um, so that's one thing. You cannot really make panels, car panels with them, because it's not, the formability is not excellent. But even then, there are many applications where you don't need to press form the material. The, the, the other thing is the fact that you have to add carbon. And that puts um, limitations on welding, for instance. Yes. And so that's particularly the reason why this solution is good, as long as you don't have to weld, as long as you don't have to do any forming, etc. cetera. So it's, it, the application possibilities of ferrite perlite steels are, are, are not that wide. In construction areas, very often, uh, certainly in building construction, I'm not talking about uh, like um, ships, for instance, um, where you do need a considerable amount of welding, um, ferrite perlite steels are, are not the, the good thing. So anyway, so first of all, let's, um, let me say a, a, a few things about, a few more things about this, uh, uh, the, the perlite. Hmm? It's, um, uh, the, the lamellar perlite has uh, one uh, very interesting thing is that you can refine it. You can inter reduce the interlamellar spacing and then the material gets even stronger and, um, and the plastic deformation, certainly when this plastic deformation involves compression, yes, compression, um, is, is quite good. So you see here, um, this is for a the, the squares here are for a uh, perlitic, purely perlitic steels, yeah? And, um, and this is for a hyper eutectoid steel, 0 0.5, 0 0.8. You can see that if I can make the interlamellar spacing smaller, yes? I, so a smaller uh, interlamellar spacing is in this direction. I can increase, I can easily, so for instance, go 400, to close to uh, 600 um, MPA in yield strength, yes, and from 800 to 1,000 uh, megapascal in yield strengths, yes. Just 
just by refining the microstructure. And, and I do want to show you this um, very interesting phenomenon uh, about cementite behavior. So again, it's impossible to measure the properties of cementite bulk. Uh, it has no plasticity in bulk, but if you look at, um, for instance, this is a, a, a perlite lamellus here, and you can see here uh, that there is a whole region of the lamella that has, has been sheared, yes? And there is no fracture, no delamination anywhere. And so here you see another very nice uh, shearing situation, yes? No fracture, no delamination. And these are, um, you know, again, you can see here the deformation of the, uh, the lamellas, the breaking of the lamellas, but there is no, um, even though the lamella is, is broken, there's no um, uh, uh, void formation or anything. So very interesting and unique uh, properties uh, in terms of plastic deformation. Yeah? All right. So uh, are there other uh, uh, steels which are worth um, talking about? Uh, well, in the, um, in the stainless area, there's one uh, very nice uh, representative um, of a um, uh, multi-phase steel. That's a, a so-called duplex stainless steel. It's sh the microstructure is here, shown here. So it's a 3D microstructure. You can see you have alpha phase and gamma phase. It has 50% of it is ferritic. 50% is austenitic at room temperature. So whereas ferrite per perlite steels are at the very cheap end of the spectrum, yes, not expensive, this material is at the most expensive end of the spectrum of steels, yes. Um, it contains huge amounts of chromium and nickel to achieve this microstructure at room temperature. Hmm? Okay. Um, and it's used mainly in, for very demanding applications in the, uh, in the chemical industry where you require strength, corrosion resistance, and um, yes, strength and corrosion resistance, basically. Um, now, how does a material like that be behave? Yes? What, what's, you know, um, well, let's have a look. So now we, uh, this, in this example, I show how this material behaves at high temperature. For instance, when you, you roll the material, and you deform it at high temperatures. So what we find out is that this is the stress-strain curve at high temperature for austenite, and this is the stress-strain curve for ferrite. The strains here are huge. This is 400%. This is and why can, uh, can I show you these very high amounts of strains? That's because it's, the results come from a torsion test. And when you do a torsion test, you can, you can have extremely high strains because there is, in principle, no section reduction. So there is no instability. And why does this, this uh, stress strain, these stress strain curves decrease here? That's because at high temperature, you get dynamic recrystallization, okay? So don't worry too much about uh, these two details, okay? But this is the austenite phase. In this case, you can actually make the austenite phase in bulk, and you can make the ferrite phase in bulk, and you can measure their two properties. And you see, very different. The austenite is very hard in comparison to the, the, the ferrite that's in very soft. And the duplex is, as you expect, somewhere in between, yeah? And so uh, this was analyzed by one of my uh, grad students in the past. And this is what he found was the distribution of the strain and the stress during the test. So, so if you measure, if you're here, for instance, uh, in the duplex steel, yes, actually you have this much stress and strain in the austenite phase and this much stress and strain in the ferrite phase. So again, you have this, what is called stress and strain partitioning, yes? All right, okay. okay. And 
uh, in recent years, there's been a flurry of interest in, this, um, in, in these uh, materials, and there's a lot of new ideas. And uh, this is just an example here of what, uh, what is currently already uh, being produced in the industry. You have complex phase steels, DP steels, we'll talk more about these today. Trip steels, we'll also talk more about these today. Which, and you can see multi-phase here. Complex phase trees is probably the most complex. Huh? It contains ferrite, bainite, retained austenite, and martensite all together. And um, we won't talk about this. We'll talk mainly today about ferrite, martensite, DP steels, or dual phase steels, and the low-carbon trip steels. Okay? All right. So, well, let's have a look at this uh, DP steel. Okay? So I have ferrite, yes, and then martensite. This, these white islands here are martensite. So I have a, a, a soft phase and an extremely hard phase. So schematically, ferrite here, martensite here, and when I take a stress-strain curve of that uh, duplex stainless, um, to me, um, dual phase steel, this will be a point on my stress-strain curve. So there are two as you know, or may know from study of composites, there are like two extreme cases of stress and strain partitioning. Hmm? You can assume that the stress is the same in both phases, or you can assume that the strains are the same in both phases. Hmm? Hmm? So you have an equal stress situation, equal strain situations. Hmm? Okay. In practice, of course, the situation is somewhere in between you. So you don't have this point or nor that point. You have a point somewhere in between here. Yeah. Okay. And then if you have two materials and you, have, you know their stress-strain curves, yes, and you want to make a microstructure containing these two phases, yes, what do you do if you want to have an idea of um, what the composite will, how the composite will behave? Hmm? how point B on the composite stress-strain curve actually corresponds to point A and point C on the uh, stress-strain curve of the, in this case, martensite and ferrite. Okay. Well, you can use uh, Tamura's rule of mixture. Yeah? It's very simple. Yes? It says that this, the only important parameter is the amount of each phase present, so the volume fraction of each phase. And so if I know the volume fraction of martensite here by metallography, hmm, um, then I know 1 minus the volume fraction of martensite, and that's the volume fraction of the ferrite. Okay, so in that case, with this rule of mixture, um, I take point B, and I draw a, a line through it, yes? A line through it, which gives me point A and point C. This line has a slope Q, which is given by the ratio of the difference in the flow stresses of ferrite and martensite and the strains, the corresponding strains in the ferrite and the martensite. Hmm? Okay, and, and you can very easily derive this uh, Q slope from this equation here. Hmm? So, so basically, if, if you have this stress strain curve, that stress strain, you can calculate your mixture, yes? Using a rule of mixture, uh, uh, yeah, this, this rule of mixture. So it's very simple, and you can do it uh, in practice. For instance, it's been done here. Mm -hmm. you have, this is the Martin side. This is the stress strain curve, mathematical form of this stress strain curve. For the Martin side, this is mathematical form for the ferrite stress strain curve. And then you have measurements. And you can see that indeed for every point here, yes, I have the corresponding stress and strains in the martensite and the ferrite. Okay, now there's a little problem, and you probably can, you can see it here. The slope here changes. So, and of course, if the phase fraction doesn't change, yes, so... Uh, this rule of mixture 
is a good empirical start to analyze the, um, the stress and the strain partitioning in multi-phase steels, but it really doesn't capture all, everything. And the reason why it doesn't capture everything is because there is an interaction between those phases. Yes? In, in this rule here, well, you just assume there's no interaction between, nothing happens basically at the interface between both of them. Okay? Okay? H having said this, um, using this rule of mixture will get you far in practice. Huh? You can see, for instance, here, this is an experimental measurement for uh, dual phase steel, cold roll grades, hot roll grades, the tensile strength as a function of the amount of martensite, the, the volume percentage in this case of martensite, and you can see it's, it's, this is a nice linear relation, right? So um, if you have uh, no better uh, theory available, you can always use the, the rule of mixture. Um, it's an empirical law, so um, it, it, you know, it, it can help you uh, do some modeling, but uh, maybe not that much. Actually, when you look at these microstructures, what can you say about them? So if we compare, for instance, ultra-low carbon steel, uh, dual phase steel, and uh, the trip steel, hmm? well, we can say, how much uh, ferrite do I have? Here I have 100%. Here I typically have um, so 15, 10 to 15% of martensite, so 85% uh, of ferrite. In this case, the amount of ferrite is decreased to 50% because I have bainite in the microstructure. The carbon content is very low here. The carbon here is all... Is, is, I have to ha add more carbon because I need to make the martensite phase. The carbon is all in the martensite phase. And in the case of TRIP, I also have to add a little bit more carbon, but the carbon is all in the bainite phase. But there's something we don't see in the microstructure, and that's the fact that they're actually internal stresses. They're internal stresses in the, uh, in the microstructure, which is the result of how we make the microstructure. So let's have a look. All right, so, so if, now if this would be a DP steel, so let's, let's for instance, uh, go here and take a sample, a TM sample, for instance, and have a look at the, the microstructure. This is, this is what you get. Okay, so this is a ferrite grain, and then you have these black things surrounding it. That's martensite. So you can already see a number of interesting things. It looks like the, in the center of the grain here, I don't have as many black lines as in the rest of the grains. You know, so if here, for instance, also you can see the, 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 these black lines, uh, you already know, are dislocations. They tend to be very, very much around the Martin side. Yes, you can see them here, yes. And these are what we call punched out dislocations. They're due to the formation of the Martin side. When you make this, 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 this Martin side, you go, you have intercritical annealing and you quench, yes? And the austenite, the high temperature austenite, will transform to martensite. And two things happen. The, the volume change is big, about 4%. So there is plastic deformation. There's plastic deformation. That causes these dislocations here, yeah? Dislocation, inhomogeneous dislocation. And the other thing is, of course, the elastic part of the uh, volume uh, strain uh, it remains in the microstructure. So around these um, uh, uh, martensite islands, there is a zone of compressive stresses. Yes? Yes? Internal compressive stresses. Yes? And all of these have an impact on your properties. So what do I mean? This is just schematically what I just said. So say you have a you have ferrite matrix, yeah? 
And in it, you have ostomite, okay? okay? For instance, at high temperature. You quench this, and this ostomite turns into martensite. Okay, let's look at what happens. Yes? First of all, the, um, uh, the austenite will shear. The lattice will shear. There will be a shear transfer because uh, austenite is a austenite to ferrite transformation. This martensite transformation is a, a shear transformation. So you have a certain amount of shear. And then there's also volume expansion. Yeah? The density, atomic density in the austenite and, and the martensite is different, so I have an expansion. Yeah? So as a consequence, inside the martensite, I get transformation dislocations, and around the, uh, the uh, martensite particles, I, I, I get dislocations which are due to the strain. And on top of that, there is a, around every particle, there is a compressive zone, yes, uh, as a result of the, the volume strain associated with the transformation. Okay. Okay, and, and, and this shows you uh, crystallographic detail. Uh, so this would be originally the these are these planes here are one 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 planes. Yes, so these one 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 planes are sheared. Yes, so then you, you form this this intermediate structure. Yes, it's not a correct BCC structure. It has to expand a little bit and then shuffle, shuffle around a little bit so that the angles become uh, correct. Okay. okay, so there is a shear and uh, some uh, expansion. Those are the main deformations. All right. Good. So we have this particle that's just sitting there in the microstructure, and it's surrounded by a mobile dislocation, and it's, it's also compressive stress on, yeah. But there's something else. Um, now let's deform this material, yes? Let's deform the material. Let's deform a, 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 a dual phase steel, which contains ferrite here, yeah? And here, this very hard phase, martensite, alpha prime. Okay, so what happens when we uh, deform? There are plenty, you generate uh, dislocations, you have dislocation loops, yes, which are shown as, as these um, uh, dislocations here with the same but opposite Burgers vectors, which will move apart, away from each other. These are internal sources of dislocations. And let's assume now that this little square here is deforms uh, as easily as the matrix, yes? So, uh, as I apply a shear here, um, that particle will be sheared. Yeah, it will be sheared. Okay. However, if this particle says I'm not deforming, yes, I don't care, I don't deform, then the dislocations, you see, the dislocations that are on this side, yes, and the dislocations that are on this side of the particle, which should normally shear through the Martin side, Yes, and go to the other side, yes, they're just stuck there, yes? So they don't leave the interface, they're just stuck there, okay? So hard phases, yes, also do something about dislocations at the interfaces, yes? So, in other words, this, this non-deformable particle, uh, this, this martensite, alpha prime, yeah, uh, ends up with an, a big envelope of additional dislocations around this. Yes? And as a consequence, if I compare this situation with this situation, and I say, well, what's the difference? Well, in this case, I accumulated dislocations. Right? So I accumulation of dislocations, remember, strain hardening. Okay? okay? Right. So can we put numbers on this? Is there a way to, to, to see how this works? Yes, we can. 
So let's have a look at the same situation now, and let's try to describe uh, in a simple model what, what happens. Okay? What we're going to describe um, is, uh, is, is what we call the creation of geometrically necessary dislocations. Or GNDs. Okay. They're geometrically necessary because uh, you'll see in a moment if they weren't there, there'd be lots of holes in microstructures. Okay, so we have cube shaped Martin site. It's here. This is the Martin site, for instance. And this is oops, Martin site prime, yes. And this is my ferrite grain here. So, and I have a little cube here, and the, the volume is L to the third. Yeah, it, it's not, it, it doesn't deform. So now I'm going to strain this in ten, ten cell stress, uh, uh, ten cell strain. Yeah? So the strain is epsilon. Okay? All right, so, so what should happen to this cube? Normally, its length should become L times the strain. Right? Now, if I have 10% of elongation, the, the L should become 10% longer, right? So it should be 1.1 L, right? So the, the strain is 0.1 L, okay? Okay, so let's, let's not do this because it doesn't deform, yes? So it should fill the, this volume. So let's assume I have half the strain on the left and half the strain on the right. So here I should have an increase in volume on both sides of epsilon times L divided by two. Yeah. It's not doing this. So, uh, but, and, and the matrix is doing it. So what's happening? Well, there's a void, right? Is there a void? Of course, there is no void. There is no void, yes? And uh, we, 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 what we do is we basically fill this void, yes, with dislocation loops. You, you know that um, if I have two dislocations that do this, it's like adding an extra, extra material, right? So that's the kind of dislocations I put in. Right? Dislocation loops that kind of fill up this void. Hmm? Hmm? And, and, and that's basically where the name comes from, geometrically necessary. Where, co where does that word come from? Why, uh, well, you know, they're necessary because if they weren't there, you know, there'd be, you know, th as soon as you start deforming uh, a, a dual phase field, they should be full of um, uh, holes, but there, there aren't, so um, there are necessary loops are created to avoid this. Hmm? Okay, um, so epsilon is the externally applied uh, strain. So we have the, the, uh, the, the increase in length here is epsilon times L, yes. The number of dislocation loops that I need, well, all of them have a width of b equal to the Burgess factor. So if, if I divide this by b, I have the number of loops that I create per particle. Hmm? Okay, and now if I want to know the, um, uh, the yeah, so, so if, if I, ha if I, if I if I have now a volume fraction of uh, F of these particles, of these Martin side particles, Fm, yeah? mm -hmm. then I can calculate the number of Martin side islands per unit volume. Okay, so Fm is n times L to the third, right? Because it's, that's the number per unit volume, and it is, this is their volume. So uh, n, number of uh, martensite islands per unit volume, is fm divided by l to the third. Okay. Okay. So so now um, the number of loops that I will generate per unit volume. So the loop density is equal to the number of uh, loops per particle times the density of particles. Mm? So if I do this, I find epsilon times the volume fraction of martensite divided by B times L, L being the, the size of the martensite. And uh, in this particular case, the loop length is 4L. Where does this 4L come from? 
one t you have to have a closed loop, right? So one, one, two, three, four times L. So four L. That's where the four L comes from. So the the density of geometrically necessary dislocations is I, I multiply this with four L. Four L times the number the loop density, yes, and I get this equation here, yes, four epsilon fm divided by beta times L. Yeah. And so that's an extra source of dislocations that is created in the ferrite because of the presence of the martensite. Yes? So I, I have, by adding these martensite particles, enhanced the, um, the, the density of dislocations in the ferrite. Yeah? And, in other words, I have increased the strain hardening. All right. Uh, so what I did here was for a tensile situation. Uh, there's some uh, original work by Ashby who, who introduced this concept of geometrically necessary dislocation, um, derived a formula for the shear uh, situation, and instead of having a factor four here for epsilon, uh, he has eight times gamma, gamma being the shear strain, okay? But it basically looks the same. And so you, uh, the, the, the big, the important parameter is of course F over D, yes? So the density of these particles divided by their size. And, and, and here is the same, the density divided by their size, okay? Okay, so if I take um, this parameter to be uh, a certain value, one uh, reciprocal uh, microns, for instance, and I calculate uh, the dislocation uh, density, geometrically necessary dislocation density, I find a very, very rapid increase at small strengths. Yes? Okay? So the, um, the impact of small particles, hard particles in the microstructure yes, is to increase the strain hardening at lower strengths. Hmm? Okay, and uh, so dual phase steels have been studied uh, in, 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 uh, theoretically in detail and you have, there are formulas for the strain hardening, yes, the strain hardening for, uh, of DP steels, yes. And um, so uh, all of these uh, agree basically with uh, this, this theory that geometrically necessary dislocation must be present hmm, because uh, the strain hardening uh, clearly shows a uh, dependence on the, the square root. Where does the square root come from? Because the, you get the square root of the dislocation density, yeah? if you uh, calculate the strain harden the, the the strengthening effect of dislocations, so instead of having F over uh, D or L, you get square root of this parameter as the strengthening factor. Right? Okay. All right. This idea of um, having a hard face um, was developed. Why, why was it developed? Well, the, in a dual phase steel or any microstructure that contains a very hard particle, the increase in the strain hardening happens in early stages. Yeah? So it's the impact on at high strains is not so important. So what do you do if you want to have, if you want to benefit from this hard second phase at later stages, right? You basically want to have martensite at the end, not at the beginning. At the beginning, you, you, you don't really want martensite because you have high 
you have already high strain hardening. But you'd like to have it at the end. And so that's what happens in trip steels. In trip steels, we gradually generate martensite. We slowly generate it, and we push back its, um, uh, the increase. We, we develop an increase in the volume fraction of martensite as we strain the material. So basically, and this is what happens in trip steel, in the trip steel, you have austenite, right? Just like in the case of martensite, you had austenite before you made martensite. Hmm? And now, we're going to strain the material and let the austenite gradually transform to martensite. Yes? So, and every time that happens, you get the big amount, this locally, you have relatively soft austenite transforms to really hard martensite, yes? And it expands. So you get, what you get? You get um, this volume change gives you dislocations. The fact that you have martensite there, you get geometrically necessary dislocations suddenly. Yeah? And then, and, and, um, and thirdly, you replace the soft martensite with very hard, a, a, a second phase that's very hard. So you get a harder phase and then an expansion. So any time there is a, um, uh, locally, a uh, tendency to neck, yes, it stops. The tendency to neck will, will be automatically stopped and delayed. Yes. Okay, so you get, you, you basically suppress necking uh, using this uh, martensite, excuse me, strain induced martensite transformation. And now um, you, you, you come into this very com complex uh, additional physical metallurgy in these steels is that, right, how do you manage this, and, uh, this transformation? How do you engineer a steel that does this? And that's basically um, the challenge if you want to um, use this phenomenon. So, so first of all, um, you're all familiar. So let, let's look at temperature uh, scale here, temperature scale. And you're all familiar with the MS temperature of austenite, right? And you think that's the only temperature martensite transformation temperature there is. Well, it isn't. Um, you have MS, you have MS sigma, you have MD, and you even have what's called MD30 here somewhere. Yes. You have no less than three or four temperatures that characterize the transformation behavior of austenite. So the MS temperature you're familiar with, that's the one where you create thermal martensite if you quench below this temperature. Between MS and MS sigma, you can form stress-assisted martensite. That means you stress the, the austenite. Yes, it is no plastic deformation of the austenite. If the stress is high enough, the martensite will form in the austenite. Once you go over MS sigma, yes, you get strain-induced martensite. That means you deform the material, you pass the yield point, and the martensite only forms after yielding. That's why we say strain-induced, because the austenite is deformed while it transforms. And if you increase the temperature, now what happens at high temperature, the stacking fault energy increases, yes? very much, and you need stacking faults to generate martensite, yes? and uh, above a certain temperature, there will be no martensite formed, and it doesn't matter how much you strain, you will always get this location slip. So if you want to have uh, a hold of, understand and control this phenomenon of the strip effect, you need to know what is the strain dependence of the 
Martin side volume fraction, and what is the temperature dependence of this phenomenon? Because it's no good having a trip steel at 100 degrees C when this, the material is going to be used at room temperature or below. Okay, and so you need to uh, look at the, the kinetics. So here you have percentage of transformed gamma in both uh, graphs, but on the left, we look at an austenitic stainless steel. So there are stainless steels which undergo this transformation and they're homogeneous, yes? And you have low carbon uh, trip steels which are multi-phase steels, yes? And where this phenomena takes place in the bainite phase. Bainite contains some retained austenite at room temperature. But the phenomenon is the same. This is the transformation rate. At minus 40 degrees C of the uh, 301, you get very fast transformation. At zero degree, the kinetics are less. And at 80 degrees, you can see it's already uh, uh, very low. And the same with the strip steel. At 20 degrees C, you have 90% transforms. At 100 degrees C, transformation um, saturates at around 45, yeah? Okay, so if you look, for instance, at the 301, and you, you look at the maximum percentage of gamma that's formed, yes, you see that at around 80 degrees, yes, uh, there's no more transformation. So this, this allows me to determine MD, the MD temperature. So it means that beyond this temperature, you will never be able to form uh, martensite by deformation. And the definition of, or the, the way you determine the MD30 temperature is by looking at the transformation kinetics of the austenite at different temperatures. Yes, at different temperatures. And then determine at which one, at which temperature, you get 50% of transformation for a strain of 30%. Yeah? That temperature at which that occurs is called the MD30 temperature. Yeah? And it's technologically a very important parameter. Hmm? Okay. Now let's look at what, this, what effect does this transformation have. Okay, well look at this true stress, true strain uh, curve here of this metastable austenitic steel, and what you see is that as we strain the material and we measure the amount of martensite, we see the amount of martensite increasing, yes, we see that at the same time the slope of this line, it's not very clear, but the slope of this line has an upward curvature. So instead of having a slope that goes like this, it has a slope like this. It has upward curvature. So in other words, if you measure the N value, yeah, the N value as a function of strain, instead of being a maximum value of about 0.2, as you have for ferritic steels, or 0.4, as you have for austenitic steels, it continues to increase and goes up to 0.6. So, yes, the trip effect gives me a very large increase in, the, uh, in both strength and plasticity. Yeah? And the reason is because of the strain hardening. And the strain hardening itself comes from, an, uh, by this uh, multi-phase microstructure, we've added more... Um, uh, capacity of the material to store dislocations. I, I'm just seeing here that I'm a couple of minutes over time. Um, if you have a class to go to, you're welcome to go. Otherwise, I'd like to stay here for um, and just go through the rest of the material. Uh, 11 o'clock, I should be able to, to go. So, um, just a few words about the strain-induced martensite. Um, so when that's the, that's the range 
the, the temperature range at which the, the trip effect occurs you know, uh, between MS sigma and MD. And the, uh, the reason why this uh, temperature range is most important is because in that temperature range, you generate a lot of nuclei for martensite, mm -hmm. additional nuclei for martensite. And they come, for instance, from intersection of slip bands or intersections of epsilon martensite plates or special dislocation configurations. This is an example here where you have at the intersection of um, slip bands and epsilon martensite, you, you form an addition, a new uh, martensite nucleation. This was um, this here. Uh, this was a structure for a homogeneous austenitic steel. This is the structure of bainite in a low carbon trip steel, and uh, so uh, yeah. This, this here, for instance, is typically bainite. The white stuff that you see here that's retained austenite. Yeah. Okay, and that's where the trip effect comes from. So these small. Uh, uh, retained austenite islands. You, you see here, here, there are three of them. Here, this one and this one. Yes. Um, when you strain the material, they will transform to martensite, and that gives you the trip effect. And the trip effect is a function of temperature. Yes, the amount of uh, martensite you make as a function of strain is a function of temperature. High temperature, you suppress it. Yes. And it's also a function of the thermodynamics of the, uh, the austenite phase, this, the, the thermodynamic stability of the austenite phase. So the composition of the austenite has an influence. And you can see the different composition here. So here, uh, silicon is partially replaced by aluminum. Here, it's fully replaced by aluminum. And you can see that I, as I replace the silicon by aluminum in this microstructure, I suppress the transformation. Okay? And again, a trip steel, a low carbon trip steel, is a composite material consisting of bainite and ferrite. Right? So the, we can make these phases separately and analyze them. Yeah? You can see the bainite's very strong phase. The ferrite is, again, a soft matrix phase. Yeah? The trip steel has a stress-strain curve in between both, again, yes? Okay. And, and again, we get load transfer, stress and strain partitioning, etc. Okay. In recent years, I just want to, to finish uh, with this. There's been lots of interest in uh, deformation twinning. Uh, if you uh, increase the manganese content in the austenite phase, you can get a steel to undergo deformation twinning. I mean, you strain the material and it forms twins. Uh, and, and there we get a a hardening effect which is a bit different. And um, we usually refer to it as a dynamic hull patch effect. Hmm? What it basically does in that phenomena is say, well, um, if you strain the material and you have a mechanism whereby you gradually reduce the grain size, yes? Uh, that will have an impact on the, uh, the strength, but a gradual impact. You don't have to start with tiny grains. You will end with tiny grains. Yes? So you get lots of strength, and you don't get the negative impact of small grain sizes on the plasticity. Why are twins interesting is because uh, they function as grain bound, very strong grain boundaries. So uh, at the beginning, I have few twins, and my dislocations have large uh, mean-free paths. 
And as I increase the density of twins, the mean free path of the dislocation will gradually become smaller and smaller and yeah, extremely small. And so I'll get a dynamic Hall patch effect. The crystallography of the um, uh, twinning is very similar, or not very similar, has some relation to the crystallography of martensite formation, of martensite transformation. So in these systems, alloy systems with manganese, you, you can observe twip behavior so t uh, and also trip behavior, depending on the composition of your steel. So this is a typical twip steel, has 22 manganese, 0.6 carbon, stacking fault energy of 20 millijoules per square millimeter is needed to, to get this uh, behavior. And you can model this very nicely. Hmm? Hmm? You remember that, um, so be, because we have these uh, interfaces, uh, we can accumulate dislocations um, nicely. And we use this uh, dislocation evolution equation that we know, that we saw in, uh, uh, previously. And we basically change it a little bit. We add a term, yes? that is very similar to a, uh, the, uh, the term that we need, that we use for grain size, yes? But in this case, it's the size of the twins. Yeah? And, but this is a dynamic term, yes? This will change with strain. So if I do, I can integrate this equation, yes? I can simply put it, take the square root of this, and then I get basically my stress strain curve, all right? So, excuse me, okay. So ha, this is the equation that uh, describing the, uh, uh, the effect of the twins, yes? So the, the, the distance between two twins, so if this is a twin, this is a small twin here, there's not a small twin here, and the equivalent to the grain size of this uh, twinned microstructure is d twin. It's the distance between two twins. The twins themselves are rather thin, yes, and they have a thickness t. Yeah? So um, the, the relation between the, 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 the kinetics are described by the distance between two twins is two times their thickness times this factor here, one minus F divided by F epsilon. And F epsilon gives me the amount of twins as a function of the strain, all right? Okay, and it's very um, relatively simple to, um, to integrate this equation, taking into account the, the change in density of twins. And if you do this, this is what you get, so this is the uh, this, if, this is the red curve shows you what happens if you have no twins, so no twins. The green curve shows you uh, what happens if the, uh, the microstructure fully twins, yes? So you, you can see here very nice upward curvature and strain hardening, yes? What, you hap what happens in reality is this blue curve or the black curve, the blue curve being model and the black curve being data, yes, where uh, you see that only a partial, the volume fraction of, excuse me, the, the, the volume of the, the material doesn't fully transform to, um, uh, doesn't fully go through deformation twinning for certain reasons. But what is very important, and that, that's uh, my closing uh, thing here, is that the, the kinetics of twinning is important, right? So I can here, uh, in these simulations, I can reduce, this is the, the twinning fraction as a function of strain. I can reduce the twinning kinetics. And when I do this, I, can, I see here that I can also reduce the uh, the strain hardening very nicely, okay? And this is the uh, stress-strain 
excuse me, the, the strain hardening as a function of strain. Yeah? So normally this curve should go like this, right? Because of this uh, deformation twinning, you see that in this upward uh, uh, behavior of the stress strain curve, you can see this here, yes? You get two effects. You get a harder material, harder, strong material, and also you delay the, uh, the onset of necking, and basically you enhance the, the plasticity. All right, I think this is the last slide. Okay, so, um, so we've come to the end of the, the course. I, uh, it was the first time, it was a new course that I taught um, uh, this semester. Um, I hope, um, my idea in uh, teaching this course was um, give people who are in steel research uh, you know, maybe a better overview idea of you know where strength comes from and, and you know what is the disloc if dislocations and stress strain curves how how do they relate in practice and um, so that was basically my aim I hope um, that uh, I've achieved some of it and uh, and, and that uh, you will you know perhaps use this type of approach in uh, in the research work uh, you do okay thank you very much for your attention and your patience boy Thank <laughs> you.